one country in one minute or so. This is Areski Daoud. I am a geopolitical analyst working as principal analyst at MEA Risk LLC, and I am also the editor of the North Africa Journal. I have started a series of short videos called One Country in One Minute or So, in which I comment on current event. The videos are generally one minute in length, though in some cases it can be as much as double or so if the topic is complex. I try to post one clip per day, and my favorite platform, frankly, is TikTok. So go there and look for me using the username Areski D, that's spelled A R E Z K I D, that's A R E Z K I D, or come back to this podcast every 10 to 12 days for a new collection of 10 newest clips. So let us start today with Turkey. One country in less than a minute. In Turkey this weekend, the incumbent president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, won a third five-year term with 52% of the voters voting for him. The guy has been in power for so long, president since 2014, so next year he would be president for 10 years. Uh, before that, he was prime minister for 10 years. So by the time he's done, he would have been in power for 25 years. Look, this is not for me to judge the Turkish people's decision, but investors don't like the results at all. I went to Istanbul twice last month and the US dollar was exchanged at some 19 Turkish lira. Uh, but with Erdogan remaining in power, the lira is expected to fall again with the dollar predicted to be traded as high as 28 lira in the months to come. From 19 uh, lira to 28 lira. That's a big, big drop in value. One country in one minute, let's go to Senegal. Now, Senegal in West Africa on the Atlantic Ocean has been a rare beacon of democracy in the African continent. But this year, President Macky Sall, yes, this guy down here, has launched repressive measures against journalists, politicians, and others because he wants to win re-election for a third term in February 2024. The director of newspaper Le Matin de Dakar, his name is Pape Alenyang, was arrested recently. TV channel Wolf TV was suspended in March and there has been unprecedented assault on freedom of the press. Now, to neutralize the military, he recently dismissed the military chief of staff, and now he is using the justice system to harass political figures that can threaten his bid for a third term. Macky Sall appears to be obsessed by his desire to hold power at any cost, even at the cost of killing democracy in Africa, and that's a sad story. One country, one minute. Let's go to Cameroon. Now, Cameroon is in West Africa and it has 250 indigenous languages and there is a civil war pitting nearly 20% of the populations on, of the Northwest and the Southwest against uh, the remaining 80%. You may ask why? Well, it's because the 20% want their independence of a state to be called Ambazonia and that's, and that's not a movie. Uh, that would be based on the fact that they used to be part of colonial Britain, while the 80% were under the French colonial rule. Now here's the thing though, France and England colonized the Cameroon for just 45 years, 45 years only, starting in 1919, and that was enough to create this existing artificial divide based on non-African languages that is killing people every day. One country in one minute, let's go to Nigeria. Well, Nigeria has a new president, Bola Tinebu, replacing the highly incompetent Mohamed Buhari. You would think the new boss should be a bit more competent, but here's a brief part, a tiny brief part of his resume. 1993, the US government alleged that Tinebu may have been involved in some sort of heroin dealing in partnership with two drug dealers in Chicago. True or not, this is public record. He has been under investigation by the Nigerian authorities, by the British authorities, on a series of damning allegations of corruption. Now he is president. And what does he do three days after he takes office? He nearly triples the price of fuel in an effort to kill popular subsidies. I don't care what the IMF says, what the analysts out there, the economists say. Such a decision is going to have a hugely negative ripple effect, not just in the average Nigerian but on all sectors of the economy. Welcome to Abuja. One country, one minute, let's go to Egypt. Nearly 110 million people, Egypt should have been a powerhouse, at least a big regional leader. 
but its politicians, and in particular its military, have been so incompetent that the country is broke and surviving only thanks to the help of its Gulf allies. Food shortages are ruining the lives of the great people of Egypt because their military leaders in control control everything. The government has been promoting chicken feet as a good source of protein to replace the hard to find meat and fish. Despite an IMF loan of $3 billion, food prices have been doubling, tripling, and even quadrupling. In their efforts to attract foreign money, two state-owned banks offer one-year saving certificates with an extraordinary 25% interest rate. Foreign tourists are now required to pay for train tickets in US dollars, and many banks have limited foreign currency withdrawals and triple credit card charges. Welcome to Cairo. Let's visit Lebanon. Lebanon has been without a president since October 2022. The president is voted by the parliament instead of the people. The problem is that the parliament is divided beyond repair and the incompetent political elite has run out of idea on how to fix the problem. Well, let's go back to 1943. Lebanese politicians came up with a brilliant, crazy idea to share power based on religion. They enacted a law that essentially says the president and head of the military will always be a Catholic, the prime minister a Sunni Muslim, the speaker of parliament a Shia Muslim. They also decided that the parliament would have a 6 to 5 ratio in favor of Christians. The problem is that the Christian population has shrunk. Many Christian elites left the country since then, while the Muslim population boomed. The latter obviously is not happy about the arrangement. The country is stalled and in turmoil now that 80% of the population is considered poor according. Welcome to Beirut. One region in one minute, I give you the Sahel. The Sahel is in real bad shape. Its population are suffering from neglect, terrorism in multiple forms, bad governance and collapsing environment and communal conflicts that are amplified by politicians. And history is to blame too. A report just published by an NGO calculates that more than 16 million people are affected by conflicts and climate change in Burkina Faso, in Mali and Niger, up 172% from 2016. Now here's the thing, the affected population is actually bigger than the population of Belgium, or Portugal, or Sweden, or the UAE, etc. The report also blames French colonial era authorities for neglecting developing peripheral areas and introducing disruptive border controls. Widespread poverty has been accelerated with the population's dependence on sectors vulnerable to climate change. And sadly, this is not going to end anytime soon. One country in one minute. This time I'm going to go over a little more than a minute because I will be briefing you on the US state of Florida. In the eyes of the world, the United States is one country, but each of its 50 states could be considered a country within the country, given that they each have their own constitution, their own laws, their own governors, their own their own parliament, etc. Let's talk about Florida today. The state has turned super conservative, even though there is nothing to conserve in the state that was created less than 180 years ago. Florida used to be swampland. Uh, still, a chunk of it is still swampland. So what is to conserve? They created Miami Vice. Uh, they, they created Dexter. Uh, they created Say Hello to My Little Friends. That's not conservative. Maybe it is. Now, the state is beautiful, without any doubt, especially beautiful for those of you who like endless summers and beaches. But the governor there, Ron DeSantis, is running for president of the United States, and so he has been catering to the religious folks without any concern for God and his moral servant in reality. You know that in Florida, you will soon be able to carry a gun in public like in those cowboy movies? That's right. The extremists in Florida government have taken a clue from countries like Uganda and Iran to push for the inspirations of virtues that are actually frontal attacks on women, immigrants, minorities, gays, and books. Yes, books. These virtues never existed in Florida. So the extremists seem to be winning, apparently, for now. And here's why. A great number of people that came to Florida recently appear to have no skin in the game. They're most of them, many of them, are transients, either as people from other states and from regions uh, from in Latin America, buying real estate uh, or retired folks, and so they don't care at this stage. So the right-wing leaders there rely on people who actually live in rural areas, and naturally these guys tend to vote conservative. Did I also tell you that the incompetent Donald Trump also lives in Florida? Gives you an idea. 
One country in one minute, let's go to South Africa. So I visited South Africa some 15 times in my life and every time I get there, I'm truly amazed by the level of development that country has achieved within the context, the broad context of Africa. Truth be said though, there's still a huge amount of progress to be made to uplift the millions of South Africans out of poverty and to reduce the awful levels of criminality there. While poverty clearly breeds crime, there is a group of wealthy people, I call them the coal industry, that has been active in blocking any progress towards the introduction of new sources of energy. Not only they have penetrated the halls of power by corrupting politicians and government leaders in their favor, but they also allegedly attempt to physically eliminate those who challenge them, like the former CEO of energy company ESCOM, who was poisoned while trying to fix the country's energy problems. What is the country's problem, you may ask? Well, the coal industry wants South Africa to remain entirely dependent on coal. 83% of electricity in South Africa is produced from coal. Donald Trump once said, coal is beautiful and clean. No, it's not, it's ugly and dirty. As a result, South Africa has not enough electricity and blackouts are daily occurrences. Next year, President Ramaphosa is up for re-election. Some analysts say that may force him to push for more changes in the industry. I'm not holding my breath though. Let's go to the United States again. As you know, former President Donald Trump has been indicted by a grand jury of Florida citizens in a case involving his alleged retention of classified documents. I'm not going to talk about this, uh, but for those of you outside of the United States, note that there is some sense of a panic mode, something extraordinary taking place in the US because, well, that's the first time a US president, or former US president, faces a federal trial. That's big. Those who hate Trump essentially now say, well, aha, I told you so. Those who support Trump on the other side see it as a vendetta, a vengeance of sort. Uh, regardless of who is right or wrong, let me remind my American friends of the following. Don't panic. Everything's going to be fine as Trump is not the first ex-politician who faced his country's justice system. Over the past 20 years or so, 78 countries jailed or prosecuted their leaders. And we're not talking about banana republics. Perhaps one of the most uh, notorious cases is that of South Korea's ex-president Park Geun-hye, who was sentenced to 24 years for corruption. 24 years. After five years, eventually, she was pardoned by her successor. That was back in December 21. France's ex-president, Nicolas Sarkozy, was convicted in two separate cases uh, and then sentenced to prison in 2021. Previously, former French president, also Jacques Chirac, got the same treatment for acts of corruption while he was mayor of the city of Paris. Other political figures who either faced or are currently facing their country's justice system include Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Brazilian pre President uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan, former Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak, former Argentinian President Cristina de Kirchner, uh, Taiwan's ex-president Chen Shui-bian, former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi, etc. Et now consider this little tidbit. In Peru, and since 1985, with the exception of one, every president has been arrested or charged over a period of 30 years. Incredible. So for my American friends who are going through panic mode, don't panic, stay calm, and carry on your daily life.